Before we start our episode today, I would like to give a quick shout out to our sponsor, Astrolabs. Astrolabs drive digital growth in companies and in people. There are exclusive discounts for the listeners of Conversations with Lulu on company licensing, uh, on co-working spaces, and on online learning. So I definitely invite you to visit astrolabs.com slash lulu and, uh, and avail your special discounts. My guest is Muhammad Balut. He's the co-founder and CEO at Kitopi. It's a Dubai-born uh, global unicorn, and that's a company that is valued at over $1 billion. Kitopi recently raised $415 million uh, from global investors led by SoftBank. But Muhammad is a true serial entrepreneur. So prior to Kitopi, he founded a confectionery manufacturing business, which he, uh, which he grew over the years to a, a business generating over 300 million dirhams in top line, and he sold his business in 2016. So uh, we're gonna, to learn more about Muhammad, you can check out the show notes. So Muhammad, thank you for being with me. Thank you for having me. I've chased you quite a bit. Yeah, no, it's great to yeah. be here. I didn't know about the confectionery, confectionery business. Yeah, that's up. actually a business I co-founded with my brother and my cousin, who, okay. uh, who after exited, continued to run it, and uh, and on, or recently also managed to sell it off to uh, to uh, and, and join a much bigger family at Aghdi and Abu Dhabi. So it continued to do really well after. After I exited, so as well. did it, it exited in 2016. So I exited in 2016. You exited, okay. And Not the business the continued to grow, and uh, okay. I was co-led by uh, my brother and uh, my cousin after it. Okay. Yeah. And now it's been acquired by a family business. And now it just got acquired by Agdia, which is a public listed uh, okay. company in the UAE. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. So you've been, as I said, this is not your first uh, rodeo, but this is a completely different scale. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, uh, lots of learnings in my first business into this, and this has been uh, uh, keeping us super busy. Yeah, yeah. So what's been, what's been on your mind recently? I like to start with this question. It's keeping yeah, you busy. Yeah, look, at different stages of uh, this journey, uh, you know, a lot of things have, have uh, been on my mind that have shifted, obviously, with time, right? So. In the first leg of the journey is like survivability. Are we going to survive? Um, it's a whole new concept. Are we going to have enough adoption? Um, are we going to be able to crack the operational complexity of this business model? Are we going to be able to hire the right talent? So that was like the first stage. Uh, then the second stage moved into, you know, this turns out to be a little more capital intensive than we thought. Can we raise as much money, right? And then there's this whole taboo of like the Middle Eastern business can't raise money, uh, there's, no, there's, there's a big funding gap in, in that late stage funding. And then, and then we, you know, that was a stage we, we went through and we obviously uh, managed to, to pass through it. And then there's the third stage where now is, now that you know, we were able to hire a great team, we, we were able to raise all that money, how are we going to really execute this at a global level, right? This is something now that is no longer just a Middle East play, right? We're looking at this on a more global level. So the, the challenges here are, how do you transform this business? Like, how do you balance speed uh, with great execution? Um, as in the early stages, you're really forgive. There's a lot. Like, everyone will forgive you if you make a lot of mistakes. Yes. It comes down to quality. Yeah. It comes down to uh, uh, just cracking up the operational complexity, right? But you know, four years, three and a half years into it, with this much funding, I think yes. people will be less, much less forgiving. So it's how do you balance speed with uh, with this okay. level of operational complexity? And that's kind of the thinking we're in now. It's like as you grow really fast, you build. You know, some companies built culture debt. I think from our perspective, we invested heavily on there. Uh, but from our Great. perspective, we built operational debt, right? We grew super fast and we did have foundational gap uh, operationally. And, and I think a year ago, we recognized that, that and we invested heavily in fixing that. Whether it's like hiring the right people, building the right systems, and just being much more customer centric. Um, and I think the pivotal, pivotal shift happened uh, in, in 2021, where we realized that actually our business is not a B2B to C business. And the real problem we're solving is not just for the restaurants, the bigger problems for the consumer. And it's that shift to become a, a B2C mind, a, a mindset. Okay. Yeah. So just to note to everybody listening, I mean, all of this happened in three years. Yeah. So all of these stages that you went through, went through that sometimes entrepreneur, like, it took me eight years, I think. I mean, obviously we never reached the scale that you're at, uh, but like it took us such a long time. So you've built it in 
I mean, again, in three years, which is yeah. phenomenal. Thank you. No, I, so I, I wouldn't say I have built it. I think you know we have a really amazing team. You have three co-founders, um, right? But we're not a founder-led business, right? This is a, this is like a thirty-person leadership team now that helps us navigate every problem you can think of. We have a very complex business model okay. across multiple markets. So uh, you know the amount of variables we have ongoing in our business is uh, like no other business, and so we couldn't have done it as just a few founders. So you know we 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 definitely have a, a much wider team helping us think through and navigate where we okay. go, and and even how we make decisions is really generated by a much wider team than just like one or two people. Of course, yes, uh, absolutely. We're not, uh, but you did start with three other people. Yes, right? you correct. were you were four co-founders. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, let's let's talk a little bit about Kitopi. So I've I've done some research online. Obviously, I think you're probably growing a lot faster than than the numbers that are published online. But can you ju just give us like an idea of the scale that you're at today in terms of like transactions, team? Uh, you know what's so unique about it as well as a business. So let me give you maybe a, a few metrics. We're in four markets now. Fifth market goes live in in a few weeks. Okay. Uh, we cross three thousand Kitopians across those markets. Okay. Uh, we have a 150 person product tech and data team. Uh, a big, uh, our, so our software engineers are all based in uh, Poland. Okay. Um, and we're looking to expand that team both in Poland and in, in the UAE. And so the team's growing very fast. But the business, tell me, tell me more about the business first. So yeah, so, so we're probably the third largest um, food operator, food platform in this region today in terms of overall food um, outside McDonald's and, and, and Yum. Uh, we come in third. So the whole goal is to really be the largest food operator or food platform in the region in the next 12 months. Okay. Um, and, and by that you mean, you so you work with restaurants? Right. Yeah. So if you think about our business model in a much more simple way, well, there's three layers to this business model. Okay. The first layer is the operating platform, okay. the production unit. Right. So think of that's the our kitchens. that's our kitchens. Yes. Um, and that's something we spent three and a half years investing heavily in to build one of the most sophisticated operating platforms you can think of. Okay. And then, and then, and, and those are present in uh, all four markets we're in, and we have a very wide dist distribution network of these kitchens. The second layer on top is content. So we think of brands as our content. Okay. And um, and we we went from licensing content. We don't want to first three and a half years. We didn't want to invest. We want to spend a lot of time, you know, on user acquisition, understanding the customer. We really wanted to spend much more time in building the kitchens. Okay. So we just licensed content. Okay. And uh, and what we decided, license content means franchise. We were franchising brands and from others. Okay, and these are existing brands. Existing brands. Okay. And then what we decided to do in the last few months is actually beyond just licensing, our the evolution went into owning brands. So we went and acquired oh. very strong local heroes, and okay. we, so we have now a mix of both. We want to always license the best uh, global brands out there. Um, can you can you give an example? I think you have them obviously listed on your yeah, website. Yeah, so like from a, from a licensing perspective, uh, we license uh, the likes of Papa John's and IHOP and Nathan's, and, and there's a wide list of brands that we work with. We just announced a uh, a big partnership with Fat Brands in the US, who so have Johnny Rockets and Elevation Burger and the likes. Okay. And so we um, so those are brands we license. And then we have brands that we uh, we decide to own. So okay. brands like Right Bite and UE and 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 the, and the cloud restaurants oh, okay. brands and and, uh, and and we have over forty two brands that we now actually have acquired, um, and that we forty two. Yeah, and, and, and this is going, right? And we're looking wow, at really Wow, this is good M&A in the, in the market, no? Yeah, and, and the whole idea here is we wanted to make sure that, it, think of it as more we're investing in amazing founders, right? Okay. So we think that, you know, if we, from just, instead of just licensing content, why don't we actually have more skin in the game, back amazing founders, and help them take what they have as, wow. an, as, a, as a local hero brand and expand it within the region? But this is slightly different from uh, like how you started, right? Or exactly. How you so we went from just licensing to now owning brands yeah. and having and, more skin. And why? In the why would you do that? So there's multiple reasons. But I mean, like for the restaurant owner, it makes sense, yeah, right? From but our perspective, there's two parts. The first part is we 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 can we cannot build operational scale if you are sitting on thousands of different ingredients and thousands of different recipes and thousands. So we wanted to find a way to start consolidating. Okay. Um, on the operational side to gain much more efficiency. So instead of having, I don't know, 10,000 brands we would license, we wanted to have much less that okay. we would own and license and then really build scale with them. 
So, so if you think of McDonald's as a benchmark, McDonald's has around 100 menu items. Okay. Similar number of ingredients, 100 ingredients. And so we have our number of menu items and ingredients are in the thousands. So okay. it's just much more complex to build scale yeah. without consolidating those numbers. Okay. And so that's the first point. So it's like building operational scale. And the second piece is we're leaving a lot of uh, uh, money behind, right? So we're, we're licensing business brands and we're growing them all over the region. And, um, and you know, we're always at risk of not being able to control that relationship forever, right? So, so our view is like if we're, if we're the ones investing to, for scale, why don't we have more skin in the game and, and capture some of that upside as okay. well and share that upside with, uh, with founders. So, so that's how we see it. So there's these two big uh, parts that are driving us to do that. That's the second layer. The third layer is distribution, right? So you produced mm -hmm. the food, you have the, you know, you manage the content that you're that are in your kitchens, but now how are you going to distribute it? And this is where we have a very strategic relationship with platforms across our markets. Yeah. Uh, these are third-party platforms, the likes of Deliver Hero, Deliveroo, um, and Jahez and Karim and the likes, where we work with them uh, to source demand. Delivery, yeah. And and we just want to make sure we're a really great partners to them and helping them solve the the problems that customers have in terms of speed, accuracy, quality of food. So okay. yeah, that's how we see our business. Wow. So, so let's talk a little bit about um, fundraising, right? Because I think this is obviously the fuel to what you're doing. Uh, and you, you kind of touched on it at the beginning. You said that there is a challenge in the Middle East that you, you can't really get a lot of money, right? In a, in a previous interview, I saw you where you mentioned that at some point after you raised $90 million, uh, you kind of almost like tapped out the market. Yeah, I think that so my view today of going through the journey we went through, if you have a great business, you will access money will not be stopping you from okay. from growing. I fundamentally believe that. But I think it's just what you have what I th this the equation is the following. You have to have a problem worth solving, right? So it has to be a massive industrial market, it's a serious problem in that market, and and you have what it takes to solve it. Um, the second piece is you have to have a team. I think at the stage of like where you're beyond the series A or B team becomes the most important part of the equation. Like it's not just about one or two founders here. Okay. It's about the wider Interesting. team. Interesting. So I would have thought it's more important in the earlier days. So earlier days, I think what's critical is, is like... It's important. It's across, the one right? or two or three people that are driving it. It's because yeah. you simply probably cannot afford to have 30, 40 people driving this. Yes. Right? But at a later stage, it's no longer just about one or two founders. Like the quality of the team behind it. And execu I mean, the team is important across the whole journey and we've invested heavily in building an amazing team mm. on day one. But I just think that if you look at what later stage investors are looking at, it's, you know, do you have, is this problem really big enough? Mm -hmm. um, do you have what it takes to solve it? Does you have the right team to help you solve it? But more important than just that, how are your economics? Like, is this now just something that's proven that you can solve it and have, are you profitable or a clear path to profitability mm -hmm. in, 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 with that as well? And so that all together makes, uh, you know, if, if a company has all that, I think they should not have challenges in accessing funding, particularly in, in days like this where uh, the market is just very liquid and there's a massive appetite to invest in the tech ecosystem. So, okay. and, and, and I think that we've been, uh, it, it's, it was much more challenging in the days of Kareem, right? Where the Middle East, there wasn't that much success stories. I think it was Souk before Kareem and that was it. I think Kareem paved the way for a lot of companies. And I think today there's a lot of amazing scale-ups coming out of our region and wanting to go global. Yeah. So I think that there's a, and also a, large, a lot of large funds, global funds, looking at this re region and seeing the trading arbitrage. So a company like us. Trading have, arbitrage, you mean the valuation, right? Yeah, so the multiples you, the company we're trading at. So if you look at, uh, we have a, sim a, company, a company similar to us in different parts of the world. And just because we're an emerging market play, Middle East based, you know, where there's a discount applied. So, I mean, it's, it's good sometimes to be the underdog. It's good to be fighting. You got to fight 10 times harder. I think yeah. for a similar company to us in the US would probably have a much easier journey in fundraising than us, given that, you know, there's this Middle East, uh, uh, challenge, yeah. uh, but I do think if you have a great company, that sh that's less of a problem it is today than it was maybe three years ago. Okay, and four hundred and fifteen, like what? You know, what? What's the fifteen for? Yeah, so um, eighty percent of that was uh, primary, joking, uh, primary capital, and and uh, and twenty percent was secondary, and okay. um, and the whole idea here was we wanted enough capital to 
uh, really do this on a global level. And I think that we think of uh, how much money we raise not as a success metric, but more about this is how much fuel we need to get to uh, to continue this journey and take it to the next level. So um, it was. I, I can definitely tell you that you know our existing shareholders are super happy with with their with their uplift. Um, and and but we're just getting started, right? This is. Yeah. Uh, we're just the Middle East region alone for online food ordering uh, in three key markets in the Middle East is a $10 billion revenue opportunity. Wow. So, um, so just imagine that now. And three key markets being what? UAE, Saudi, Saudi, UAE, Kuwait. Kuwait. Um, in, yeah. Okay. And, and imagine now that on a much wider. So Egypt for online ordering is actually not yet developed. So Egypt's very developed for offline ordering. Okay. But online ordering, it's catching up fast. Because um, of like the credit card penetration or? I think for multiple reasons. I think just adoption of online ordering has been low in okay. Egypt versus other markets. And, uh, and, and I think that aggregators now are trying to educate the market much more. We, we typically like to enter a market when the market's really educated in, uh, in online ordering because we're enablers in this ecosystem. We're not, the, we're not the ones actually sourcing demand. Okay. So I wanted to ask you, you know, me being an entrepreneur, probably lots of entrepreneurs listen to this. Is there like a, a secret sauce to, to kind of reach out to investors? I mean, I know you spoke about the team and the product. But is there a way maybe to approach different investors? Like for you, for instance, you have global investors as well. Is there a, is there a time where you need to start engaging them? Can you maybe yeah, share some I, I would, of the learning? I would, I would say it's just like any normal relationship, right? So like I, if you're just trying to build a relationship with any human being in this world, you don't, I think, just a random cold call and someone uh, wanting to be best friends with you or yes. wanting to give you a lot of money or wanting to marry you, I don't know, whatever <laughs> that relationship is, yeah. doesn't happen overnight, right? So I think that building a relationship over time is important. And so, and that's how, you know, that's a big part of one of the founders' role is to invest heavily early on in building uh, a trusted relationship with a network of investors. Yeah. And, and you were plugged in, you mentioned with Endeavor, right? Which is a, yeah. which is a very global network. Endeavor definitely helped in the early days, and, and, and uh, I'm a massive supporter of everything Endeavor does, whether it's on the catal Endeavor Catalyst, their invest investment arm, yeah. or their teams on the ground, or their teams in, in, in their global team. It helps you just understand your business in a very different way and connect you to different people that you need at different stages of your business. Okay. So Endeavor definitely helped, but I just think in general, once you first get your first set of investors, you should really see them as a, a, a way for you to introduce you to a much wider list okay. of investors. So they right? play a big role. So they play a vital role in connecting you to more investors. And also okay. choosing your early investors correctly is critical, right? So in this case, having Beko on our journey early on has been instrumental, right? I, I, I think that the way they pitch Kitopi is probably even better than I do, right? The yeah. way they connect us to a much wider network of investors has been instrumental in us you know, and getting to you know, getting access to them where typically would have been, it would have been much okay. harder. I think having the right angel investors early on is very important. Really? And angel okay. investors not just from the region, but also from a global landscape, who can also vouch for you and and uh, and wanting to want to connect you to others. Did you have global angels initially? We did. We did have a couple of global angels okay. on our cap table, and it has uh, helped a lot. I so we had the likes of Travis, uh, the founder of Uber. Um, we had. Uh, one of the founders of Global Ventures, of Google Ventures, uh, we had um, uh, the one of the edit, editor in chief of uh, uh, Wired magazine. Wow. Um, okay. How, how were they from your network or from the were, investor, the, the other angels? You know, they were from from other angels. They were from our network. Yeah. Were, I do think that having angels very early on is important. Um, having really amazing world class VC, regional VCs. Uh, on the early stages is very important. I actually think it's more important having global VCs. I think that um, a local, v a regional VC, a really good one, will help you understand, in, 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 in understand your the, the landscape you're in much better than a global VC can, especially in that seed A kind of stage where you need some level of support, even that mental support, right? The, the support that, there. that no one is that no one talks much about. Is that you know it's a very lonely journey. I'm sure you, you understand it. And just having someone you can talk to. I mean, you typically can't vent and can't, you know, share your emotions with people in the business because just everyone looks at you for an ultimate yes. uh, uh, support. Strength. Exactly. So this is where having a really good VC who can be your list, you know, listen for listen there, be there for you, has helped us a lot. Has helped me personally a lot. So, 
So that's, uh, that's, that's critical in the early stages. Yeah, so you, have a, you had a relationship from day one built on uh, mutual respect, and I think that's yeah. how you, there's a, there's a friendship that evolved. Yeah. So, so that's great because I, I think, you know, as a founder, fundraising used to take so much time. Uh, you know. It will always take a lot of time. Yeah. So it's a, Does like, it? Yeah, think of it as like any other relationship that you have high, high vested interest so in. How, how are you splitting your time today? You still do the. the I have a, a phenomenal CFO. Yes, uh, who, you mentioned before. Who helps me a lot in in building up the relationships and, and maintaining relationships across uh, a wide range of investors. I think that the CEO of the business in general needs to invest a part of their time, depending on the, the stage of the business or the cycle of fundraising, sometimes more time, sometimes less time. But um, you shouldn't just go to investors when you need to fundraise. Like You should be in constant, doing constant check-ins. Yes. It should be very close to them. They should, they, it should always be a warm relationship. And that's how we, and that's what has, has helped us throughout the whole journey. Okay. In, in this last round, um, the, all, the, all the, the term sheets we got and all the relationships we had were based on existing relationships that we had. They were not, they, nothing was like a cold new relationship, okay. which has helped in, uh, in building out, uh, in, in making this transaction much faster and much more efficient. Okay. How has the, the board of directors, like, because I assume your board might have changed uh, throughout the year, so how, how important was the role of the board maybe beyond uh, fundraising? So, you know, I think the one, another very important thing that the CEO should always do is like manage the board really, really well. Board okay. dynamics can either shape a business to be successful or destroy a business. So you could, if you could do everything right in the business, absolutely everything right, but if you have a bad board, you could just completely fail. Okay. And I think we've been very fortunate to have an amazing board on day one. So at the early stage, your board's really there to be like a sounding board to, to you know, throw out ideas at them, uh, help you navigate uh, put, you know, potential challenging uh, roadblocks that you have in front of you. And you become actually very close to them. Like I, I'm very close to my, to my board. Uh, and then over the years- How many people were on your board? So in, in early days, it was like three of us, like Itopi and, and, uh, and two of our okay. early investors. And then that grew to six, and then you know, three of us and three of them, and it grew now to eight. Okay. And I, th I think with time, the board only grows. And, um, and I think managing board dynamics and making sure you come in really ready. Like, so in our early days, the board was used as a sounding board, but also like for updates. In our later stage, or the stage we're in now, where it, you know, everything on an update it happens before the board. So you know, our view is that if you come to the board, there should never be any major Surprise. surprises. Everyone should already know everything happening. You should, if there's anything that is controversial in nature, have this one-to-one -one with people early on. Yeah. They should, should have been signed up to it. And, there, and the discussion should not be anything controversial there and then. So we, we, we give out a lot. Like our last board session, we had like a, just under a 100-page pre-read for everyone, right? So everyone had to read the 100 page wow, uh, document. Wow, it's a lot of homework. <laughs> well, you come in at least then, there's, it, there's very little updates. Okay. Because so everyone did the update and it's just a much more engaging session where everyone knows everything about the business and is up to speed and you get to talk about, in our case, we talked about three big topics uh, and, and it was a very good session for us, for everyone there, right? So everyone's helping us shape up a strategy versus just like slides to go through. Okay. So you use the board for, for more, as you said, like strategy and yeah, forward more looking. engagement. Okay, versus let's review how the business is doing. Because exactly. that's already been done. Yeah, that, I mean, if it's, like, if that's also how we conduct business at Kitopi, right? So using, so if we have a presentation at Kitopi, it's always either is this an update session or is an engagement session. And update sessions, most of the time, can be just shared over a document that someone can read. Yeah. You don't need to really have so many people on a call just to um, run so many updates. From an engagement perspective, that's a better use of everyone's time, where you can really create much more engagement in, in particular sessions. Okay. Culture, you spoke, uh, you mentioned culture, I think, at the beginning. So how, how do you manage now uh, keeping the culture? Do you have a culture deck or? Yeah, so we, we uh, maybe beginning year two, we really look back at our values and reset our values. And, okay. and, and every year we look back and, and say, are these values still true to where we are today and what needs to be revamped and refreshed? Uh, we looked at our mission and, and, and vision and, and restarted that as well and understood that it went from a B2B to B to C business to a B2C business and that's, that was more relevant for us. So I think over the years, 
you know, we're, and why also... Why do you say, sorry, why do you say it's a B2C business now? I mean, you're still working with restaurants, right? Yeah, we, th we see that as content to enable us to get to the consumer versus we're not servicing restaurants anymore. We, okay. we think of customers and consumers as the paying customer, as people we need to make sure that, you know, we're satisfied, you know, our, 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 what, we're, what we're trying to do is satisfy the world's appetite. And to satisfy the world's appetite is not to satisfy the restaurant's appetite, it's so the world's appetite. And if they're happy, if customers are happy, restaurants are going to be very happy. Okay. And restaurants are providing us content to go to, off to consumer. And I know that you know, it's pretty cheesy to always to, to use Netflix as analogy, but if you think of Netflix as they license content to give consumers what they want to watch, yeah. think of that logic as something we want to apply as well. Okay. Okay, sorry. So that's so on the culture, the culture piece, side. Yes, I just wanted to clarify that because you mentioned yeah. that. So on, on the culture piece, this is something we uh, we invest heavily on. I mean, we have five priorities in the business, and every year we really look at our five priorities and re reestablish them. And they are. Can you and, share that? Uh, yeah. So for 2022, our five priorities are first, and even our five priorities are ranked in order of a priority. Right? So okay. Our first priority of next year is to be the best place to work. And this is not just like a really nice uh, statement to use. This is like a, a massive party that we're actually spending a lot of time and resource to, okay. to get to crack. And it's, uh, it's, it's relatively easier to crack this from a head office perspective, um, but it's much harder to crack when you have a, a very operationally intensive business like us. Floor. So how do, you, how do you make sure that's the case for frontliners? And so, and that's something that's very important for us. So we're uh, really revamping that entire strategy, and, and next year nice. we believe we're in on track to uh, to get there. So um, that's part two. And part two is to build operational excellence. And I think that a lot of businesses who are operationally intensive don't invest early on in this. Uh, we are one of those who probably should have invested early on, and we didn't. And um, and we quickly rectified that. In know. terms of what, like software use or, or everything. So when you think of operational excellence, you need software, you, you need uh, processes, you need the right team, you need the right mindset that you have to be customer first. And to be customer first, um, you need to make sure you have the right opportunity. Uh, you can't just say I'm so customer obsessed and you can't deliver food on time. You can't deliver food consistently, right? It just doesn't tie up. So you need to make sure you have the operational base to build on scale. Okay. So, and that's a second priority for ours. So I think that, I that's saw uh, an interview you did with CNBC recently that takes you like, what, I think you try to keep it in, in eight minutes for food prep, yeah. right? So we, we, we're pretty granular with, with how we track our performance, operation performance. And I mean, speed is something, but more important than speed is quality, right? So making sure that we can cook fast, but we can even, as a, to customers, we can give them really the food they want yeah. uh, on their own terms. Okay. So, uh, so that's the second priority. Third priority for us is to really make sure that we're complementing working with the great partners that platforms are with an offering that's unique to the customer f w through the restaurant. So you really have a personalized experience. So if you think of your experience ordering food today mm -hmm. uh, online, you're not, no one's thinking about your food on your terms which is how we think about the world now. So everyone's thinking about food when it comes, so if, if you know, either you have a certain allergy or you have intolerances or you simply just don't like certain ingredients or you wanna lose weight or gain weight or you wanna have budgetary goals, no one's really solving that pain point and personalizing food for you. And okay. that's an area we feel we wanna play a big role in now. Okay. So that's the third priority is how do we complement working with platforms with a per much more personalized experience. Okay. And the, the fourth priority here is, um, is, 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 is building an M&A center of excellence. So as okay. we acquire and invest in much more brands, integrating brands and integrating culture is actually a massive priority for our business. And it's something that we didn't have to think about two and a half months ago. And now has become something that's very critical for us. Yeah. And in, in most businesses that acquire and integrate, that's one of the biggest reasons why they fail is they couldn't do it successfully. So that's a massive part To sort of get the culture is working together just or? Like we are going to be uh, this year probably 5,000 people by the end of the year. And, wow. and by end of next year. From 3,000. Yeah, and by end of next year, we should probably cross 15,000 people. So integrating frontliners and, you know, a much wider team across the board, across so many markets is not easy. Integrating processes, integrating systems, and so there's a, a company we're integrating with now using a very completely different type of ERP solution, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, and, and how do you make sure, do you switch their ERP to our ERP or you, you know, are, we, are we gonna integrate ERPs together? So the complexities become not that easy to look at. And so 
That's the fourth. And the fifth one is smashing our budget. So, and why we have, and this is both top line to bottom line. Oh, I was going, okay. And so our, the logic here is if you, if you as a product manager or as a, a country head or any kind of function leader had to make a decision on a trade-off, right? is this, you want to make this the best place to work? Or is this like something that's going to impact that priority? Or is it going to impact your budget? It's very clear to us on how you make decisions because this is how we think of what's more important to us. Wow, that's a yeah. lot to do. Yeah. <laughs> and I see you have a ring on your finger, actually, I just noticed. So how has all of this sort of impacted life? I mean, it uh, must be pretty chaotic so, and hectic for you. Yeah, so I, uh, I've been married now for uh, uh, nine years, and, uh, and I think my wife's been very supportive on day one, uh, my first business and then my second business. And so, oh, so she's been through, oh, yes, okay. She's been through the whole through journey both. with me. Yeah. And, uh, and I think that this is something I, I tell my team the whole time. This isn't, there's no like start date and end date to this journey. And this is really a journey. And how do you make sure your lifestyle is managed along this journey? Right? How, you know, if you're going to burn out every single week and you're not going to, then that, that's a problem. And we, what we're not looking for is people who are looking at their stock options and saying, when do they invest? And that's how long I want to be here. Mm -hmm. But more, how can I make this part of a much wider journey? And I can actually make my life work along this journey where I can spend time with my family, I can spend time with my friends. Yeah. So it's not easy and I make it seem like it's, I mean, it's super difficult to do. I can imagine do. how hard it must be. Yeah, but it's, just, it's something we're very conscious of and, and, um, and we're trying to be more empathetic to, uh, to understanding that I wouldn't call it work-life balance because that's not something I see the world through. I, I see it as like more how do you enjoy what you do uh, but also make enough time for everything else that you do outside work outside just work and how do you make sure both yeah. are managed super well and everyone's happy. You spoke about vesting. Have you uh, have have any of your uh, of your team members uh, sold some shares on the on the uh, secondary market? No, not yet. We're actually this, hap this is happening abroad, right? Yeah, we're exploring creating a small buyback opportunity now. Yeah. Um, I think the, our part of the world has only had one successful uh, exit opportunity for uh, for for employees of a company, like Kareem, Kareem right? Yeah. So that was the only, so only time that people actually, as a wider team, or one of the only times, not sure if others, actually made some money. Mm. And so the idea of stock options is not as clear um, as it probably is in the US, in this part of the world, where, where definitely Kareem has set the tone better. I remember we have one of our best product managers. When we were interviewing, when, when my, part, my partner was interviewing her, she's like, you know what, I prefer no stock options, just give me a higher salary. And if you ask her today, she's like, and what we didn't listen to her, we gave her enough stock options. Okay. But if you fast forward today and ask her the same question, she'll tell you, I can't even believe I said that, right? Because but in, in her mind, that wasn't that important. She didn't understand that world. Mm. And she didn't think you can actually make money off that yeah. stock option. Because even at this stage, you know, people in your company can make uh, some, yeah. some nice returns now. Yeah. yeah. So we have uh, over 100 people today that are uh, uh, worth over a million dirhams. Uh, so, uh, which is amazing, right? The fact that people are seeing the fact that in they three just, years, yeah, and and I do think that this is just the start. Uh, we we definitely are trying to make uh, our stock option pool much wider to have a much like a, the whole goal is to have the vast majority of the business to hold, to own stock, and that's something we'll constantly every year look to top up and, and grow that pool. Okay. So I'm just going to end with five uh, rapid fire questions. Just give me one word answer, whatever pops into your mind. What's your favorite dish? My favorite dish, it's, it's a tough one. I know. I, so I eat the same dish every single day um, in, the, in the office. It's, uh, it's the Mexican bowl at Go Healthy in the UAE. So you eat that every day? Every single day. Why? You don't want to lunch. think about food? I Are you the Zuckerberg like, of, uh, yeah, of food? On food I mean, it's just so much easier. Just reorder it every single day. And really? It's, it's, uh, it's super consistent. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, what part of your day do you, uh, sorry, what part of your work do you enjoy the most? Uh, you know, it change, every year it changes. And, I, and I, I, I wouldn't say there's like one thing I enjoy more than others. I, I definitely enjoy the part where I'm personally developing and learning to be a better coach uh, more than anything else. I what? hate long meetings. I'll tell you what I don't like. I don't okay. like long meetings. I don't like 
you know, presentations that are beyond like two meeting, slides. Like longer than half an hour? Or? Yeah. Okay. For typically in my calendar, there's nothing over 30 minutes, right? Okay. So anything over 30 minutes, preferably nothing over 50 minutes, uh, you know, very short presentations, preferably even no presentation, just a discussion. Okay. And, um, <laughs> and, and yeah, just uh, what I enjoy is, is sitting around, is having intellectual discussions, with people who are uh, going to challenge me and, uh, and are, and, and are going to really look at being the best version of themselves in every single part of their day. Yeah, me too. Over food. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll add that. I've done a lot of that over the, over the years, and so now I'm doing less of that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Try more talking, my... less food. Exactly. <laughs> uh, one tip for entrepreneurs who want to fundraise, just one thing, one advice. Just be very authentic. And I think you know, one of the biggest challenges that uh, people, people do is that they oversell that business or their themselves. And I think investors have seen enough uh, deals that know how to call BS. And so just be super authentic, be genuine, talk about not just what's amazing, but your challenges and, and try and just be real. And I think people just really respect that. Um, advice to young people graduating from a university today? Graduating from university. Mm. Um, yeah, look, I, I would say I, I just pursue you have things. Kids? How much? I do have two young kids. Oh, okay. So I, I'd say that pursue things that, you know, this whole idea of like, oh, do what you absolutely love, yeah. I don't agree with. Yeah. I just think do what you're really good at. That's <laughs> my view on life. Like, if you're really good at something, okay. do it. And if you're not good at something, don't do it. Just because you're probably not going to enjoy it if you're not good at it. And I think that as humans, we're typically going to enjoy more things that we become good at over Correct. time versus things that we don't and it'll demoralize us. So uh, the best outcome is if you, you do something that you're really good at and you love, yes. uh, that's like the sweet spot. Okay, but do what you're good at. Do what you're really good at. Not follow your passion. Hopefully that's, that sits in the same box. Hopefully they're the same. Okay, one item on your bucket list. Uh, travel much, 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 much more than I'm doing now. Oh, okay, I want to continue you haven't that. been traveling? Not, not just for work, I travel and explore life. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank for you the for great having tips me. <laughs> and for the great discussion. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for tuning in to Conversations with Lulu. I do hope you enjoyed the conversations with Mohammed Balut, one of the rising stars in the rising companies in, uh, in our region. Definitely uh, a lot, there definitely there's a lot that's gonna happen in the future. Uh, some great news for sure, they're just getting started. So, uh, so we're definitely gonna be uh, tracking his success and his team's success as well. As usual, if you want to reach out to me, you can visit conversationswithlulu.com. Uh, you can go on the contacts page and you can reach out to me there for uh, guest uh, recommendations, for feedback, for sponsorship opportunities and more. You can also support the show by following uh, myself on social media, on LinkedIn, Twitter or Instagram at the handle Lulu Hazen. Uh, you can also subscribe on your favorite podcast app or on YouTube. You can leave us a, a rating and a review. It definitely helps in uh, the show getting discovered and also helps in you know, people wanting to, uh, to give it a listen. Uh, you can also send it to your friends, family, colleagues, anybody that you think would benefit from this conversation. So once again, thank you so much and uh, we'll see you again soon.